read more city books, read something that's different from your life because that's how we learn. We cannot fly everywhere. We cannot be everywhere. We cannot know everyone. We cannot be everything. Um, but books give you this like incredible magical opportunity to be of a different community for a few hours. And we are in a moment politically where we can really use spending some time in other people's shoes. And I think the foundation um, can't really be political because it's like readers are everywhere and they are everything and they vote for everyone. Um, but what we can do is sort of say, here's some information that we think might be good for you. Here are some stories of immigrants. Here are some stories um, about you know, people who live in rural communities. Here are some history books that we think are artfully done. I'm reading a book called Sex and the Constitution right now that is by like a University of Chicago law professor talking about how you know, sex wasn't a part of the Constitution. Like, parsing how we live our lives in bed was not the intention of the document, and it goes through hundreds and hundreds of years of law um, and makes the case. And I wonder if somebody who shares a totally, or has a totally different perspective from mine might actually look at all of those different arguments, and even if they don't come out on the other side agreeing, might think I'm less, of, like, less scummy for feeling the way that I feel. And I think that that's really helpful. So I think that that's some of the work that over the course of the next couple of years that I hope we can do. And I'll keep shouting on the internet and hope I don't get fired. <laughs> <laughs> so Robin, when you write, is politics part of your process? How much is politics embedded into your poetry? I don't think I really understand what you mean by politics in that context. Do you mean am I trying to change the world, what I'm writing? Am I thinking about that? Or am I trying to engage a particular political agenda? I guess, I mean, um, that uh, I think sometimes people think of writing as a purely creative project that exists in like this very rarefied little um, vitrine around which the outside world doesn't touch. But your work is engaging with Racial, Who race, and gender. That? Come on. <laughs> well, I guess I don't believe that myth, first of all. I think that all work is political, all art is political. I'm in that camp where even if I'm going to write about that lamp over there, that it takes place in a particular historical time and context, and um, the air has a particular history and story that it confesses at all times and so if I'm going to do my job well I also have to write about the historical moment in which that lamp is on so it doesn't matter what I do I'm always thinking that way it's not a conscious thing that I'm like I have to write about whatever I just don't you know um, but, but I just think that politics are always with us while we're brushing our teeth, while how we look at ourselves in the mirror. I mean, we have been completely indoctrinated by her, our historical context. And so we're brushing our teeth in the mirror. It is a moment, a political moment. It always is for me. I'm not saying consciously. I'm saying we're alive at the same time together. And... Um, I forget what you guys, someone was just saying, I forget what happened. Something just happened here about 10 minutes ago, and I was thinking, oh, we don't know how our government runs. And I was thinking, well, right, because they gutted civics in the 80s, right? And so, and so you know, I uh, am a teacher, and when I remember profoundly this moment, I was also teaching that guy you were reading who we were talking about, that novel, Pakistani writer, I can't remember right now. He, um, brilliant novel, but I remember looking at my students going, oh my God, it's Reagan. Like, there was this complete moment where we were just having a conversation in South Asian novel class, right? And somehow, um, oh, we were talking about, you know, the difference between uh, voting um, in the United States and voting in India, where there's so many parties, and I don't know, the voting population is something like 78% at the time it was, and ours is abysmal. And so, um, just thinking about that, and the students didn't know what, in God's name I was talking about, in terms of just the structure of voting. And I was like, oh, they didn't have civics. And then you have to redo the civics class. So you see what I mean? It comes up for me in these very quiet ways. But I wanted to also, I guess I should add, when Lisa was talking about uh, you should read uh, people who are rural, should read cities, things like that. Uh, partly what I try to do, and the reason why, I have two poems in my book, that book in the uh, book, it's, uh, and both deal with the fact my family's from Louisiana, 
And uh, my family owned slaves, the black side of my family owned slaves. And it was a very shameful thing to hold um, in my mind most of my life. Now I'm not ashamed at all. I'm just very interested in all the ways in which that can be, um, all the things that can teach us. But I purposely put those poems at the beginning and the end of my book because I wanted to invite us to stop saying not me, not me, not me, not me, and say, yes, me, yes, me too. And I hope that by modeling that in those poems, um, to say, if I can say this, because it was at the time that Confederate flag debate, debacle, not debate, debacle was happening, right? And I was like, you know, if I can say, look, my black family owned slaves, certainly you can say your white family did too, mm -hmm. right? And so it became a, a really interesting way to have conversations with readers, um, both in, in like this and events like this, but also um, through uh, you know interviews and whatnot. So in that way, my work can be political. But I always say that I'm a pastoral poet that's stuck in a post-colonial body. I would really, really, really like to write about flowers and birds. I would really <laughs> like to do that. And so that's why there's so much pastoral in my work, but it's completely being ruptured at all times by the political and historical, the same way that you know Thoreau, when he went to Walden, thought he was going to transcend, and he ran into a lot of runaway slaves. right? So I don't feel like my work is political necessarily. I feel like the world is political, and it ruptures my life. It's a real privilege to be able to consider yourself not political, to be able to forget. You know, I mean, it's like, I, and this, I'm not a writer, but like I got my job, like I'm just like a person who works and I got a job and then all of a sudden she's the first African American right. woman Absolutely. to run the National Book Foundation. Absolutely. And that's not about whether I'm political or not, I right. don't have a choice. Right. I can either lean into it right. and do what I can do and sort right. of use that as a way to hope further affect change, but it's like I didn't really have a choice. If I didn't want to be described that way, I had no option. Exactly. And so that's an interesting question, I think, mm -hmm. like just when you think about this, sometimes you just can't avoid it. It's a real privilege to be able to say, and I think that, you know, women are often boxed in, people of color are often boxed in, and so it's like, it's really hard to escape it. Mm -hmm. Life and writing. Rachel Lynn, what ways does your work engage with politics or not? Well. Yeah, again, I, when Robin asked you what you meant by politics, I was thinking it, maybe there's a way in which I don't really separate um, the two spheres. Like there's the world of art and the world of politics and I don't, uh, too many things to say. I mean, I, um, I feel like one of the weird inheritances of like the neoliberal end of the 20th century was this thing called humanism where people came to believe that like um, under one umbrella all people share the same forms of common decency um, on a very complicated sort of Judeo-Christian level that may be true and I'm actually even interested in it but on a more ideological level with which it was usually sort of waived um, I don't think it's true at all that people have common cause and feel the same way. And I think maybe there there have been like moments and things I've read um, where the writer sort of wants to believe that like um, a slave in Mississippi feels the same way when her fabric brushes across her, you know, shoulders uh, on a whatever on a humid summer night as you know a white woman in Darien, Connecticut, or something like that. But I don't believe that they feel uh, the same way, and I'm sometimes offended by that kind of thing when I read it. I don't want to sound morally righteous, though, which is something I'm also not interested in. I'm someone who is interested in examining herself and getting up in the morning and asking how I can be a good person. Um, when I go to write, I want to and hopefully do consider the sort of warp and weft of my character's reality, the structures of class and race and history that they move through. And I don't do it as a kind of polemical burden. It just seems natural to me that that's what people are built of, um, are these conditions that pressure their lives. So maybe that does result in something that some people would call political. I mean, I'm also interested in larger political movements which have ended up in both of the novels that I wrote, um, just because it's 
th th those are like big stories of history. Um, so, you know, if I wanted to like dip in and write a book about the 1970s, I was going to write about something that was bigger than just a few people's lives and had more like the logic of crowds or mass movements about it. But yeah, I, I don't separate the two or think of myself like, well, these are political novels, so only read them if you're interested in politics. It's, it's more like one, it's one thing to me. So then, do you think that in this moment that there is a place for novelists, say, to speak, bring some of that knowledge and that, um, and this richness of how you describe what the creative work is that you do into the public sphere and, and represent? Oh, because of uh, the Donald Trump and the presidency and all that? Is that what yeah. you're asking about? Yeah. That. Well, I have very mixed feelings about all that, and they change really from moment to moment. Um, it, I don't, yeah. we, like I've been getting these emails every day, <laughs> again my email, but um, like Penn America has been doing this thing in terms of trying to get writers on board to speak in unison and I've had other writers write to me and say, you know, we have to come out as a group and writers resist and writers defend and all this stuff. And I'm actually personally very ambivalent about it. It's fine I think for other people, I don't have a judgment of it um, as a method and a tool, but for me I don't really speak as a chorus with other people. Um, I seldom agree with them about politics. Like, you know, I hate Donald Trump, but I, you know, Obama deported 2.5 million people. I don't know, like, w at what point do you get up and say something publicly? I just don't know. Like, I do certain things in my own life um, to remediate anguish and guilt. I'm involved with prison abolition. I'm, like, it's a huge component of my life that has nothing to do with writing and maybe that's where I um, enact that kind of old-fashioned activism urge. Um, maybe at some point I would write like an op-ed if the New York Times would publish it um, saying that capitalism has to implode. I would want to do something really extreme and like use my platform for good. You know, I'm not joking. But uh, but in the meantime, I, like, I'm not on social media and I'm also kind of shy and I don't like from day to day know what I specifically have to offer other people to like use the public platform of a novelist to say something, so I'm hesitant to do that. Lisa, Robin, you guys want to jump in? Because uh, I want to know what you think. It's funny, those pen emails are interesting. And I mean, I'm not a writer, so it's like I don't need to sign my name as a writer. Um, but it does seem like... I don't know if writers banding together or literature banding together and making some sort of like anti-Trump statement is so useful. It seems like a little bit too fuzzy. And there's not an explicit goal of what we want other than we don't want Trump. Um, I think that... Penn is a free expression organization, and so when there are direct challenges to free expression, I think that that is time to activate. Um, but I, I think that, you know, like we were talking about earlier, that, that writing is political. I think that the job right now is to make sure that we're telling the stories that need to be told, that we're supporting the work of the writers who are not making it out into the world, um, and to make sure that there's an equitable environment. You know, um, and I was joking earlier about like people not knowing that like a black middle class girl could exist, but I think that you know, it, it, people can be very hateful when they don't recognize the humanity of another person when they are so unfamiliar that they don't need to acknowledge you. Um, James Baldwin in a film you were talking about Lorraine Hansberry, and there's a film that's out right now by Raoul Peck called "I Am Not Your Negro," which is a documentary film um, that's narrated using text that was unpublished by James Baldwin. It's amazing, and one of the archival videos that they use is of him talking about the fact that racism doesn't exist. It's a lack of knowledge. It's a, I don't know you and there, you know, you're, it's not racism. It's a complete unfamiliarity with everything that I am. And I think that um, the role for me or the, what I hope from writers is um, to continue to make everyone um, that they write about familiar to others so that we have less, um, less of a, less of a, less ease with denying people their basic humanity and less aware and more awareness of the things that are truly happening in the world. So, um, but like standing up together at a march, 
I get really fi finicky about marches, and I'm like, what's the three-point outcome strategy here? Exactly. And if not, I'm not marching anywhere for you. Exactly. I want to know what we're marching for, what the hope and desired outcome is, and what the timeline is for achieving that outcome. You get, I'm not you get stuff done. You just get stuff done. That's what you do. I yelled at a friend the other day. She was really mad. I was like, what are you even marching for? <laughs> just but the ladies? The direct action at the airports... Um, that worked for me. Works, right? I mean, it's su suddenly... Um, I was out of town for that, and I was like, that is something I can march for. And I thought the Women's March was actually really amazing because it was an act of solidarity. Um, it was nonpartisan. It was about numbers, and it actually achieved a really specific thing. Um, but, there, but, you know, I think the protest component of sort of the creative community has yet to come into play. But, you know, NEA um, may well come under threat any minute now, the National Endowment for the Arts. And what people don't often know is that um, some years ago, it's always under threat, like the NEH and the NEA. And um, when they were making cuts, maybe 20 or so years ago, um, there was a group called LitNet, the Literature Network, that actually banded together to lobby for the literature fellowships to remain in place. And they're the only fellowships that are still intact at the National Endowment for the Arts. And that's actually all going to go down when they proposed the 2018 budget. Um, so then there's a moment for writers to band together to preserve the only fellowship that exists for artists in America that are federally funded. Um, and then I think we have something to, you know, the creative community, I, I don't mean to we with writers because I'm not a writer, but um, then there is a reason, I think, to, to have a direct political conversation. Um, I also think that it would be great if we could band together to help uh, make a voice against uh, Trump's uh, assault of the First Amendment, and journalists specifically. Like, I think the, the breakdown in genre really hurts us at times, because I totally want to support journalists right now, and definitely want to support the First Amendment. I'm very aware that the kind of writing I do, if I lived in another country, and in a particular country, I would be in, in a lot of trouble, um, if, if not in jail. And so I'm always an advocate for the First Amendment, and I think it's, it's time right now with regard to writers uh, to really support journalists. At the same time, I'm really pissed at journalists right now, and I have been for a year and a half because I, I just can't believe the way they did not, um, so many in the corporate media, did not uh, uh, exercise completely the, the rights given to them by the First Amendment in the last election. And so now to be you know, trying to back paddle and say that, you know, these abuses took place and uh, et cetera, uh, feels way too late for my taste. I'm glad it's finally happening, but even when I watch press conferences, you know, I still think that, you know, we tell our students all the time, you are in such a privileged position to be a student. Now is the time. You know, and I feel that way too about journalists. It's like you're completely protected. And sure, you might lose your job temporarily, but the First Amendment, they can't touch you, you know? And so I feel like where I want to put my activism in terms of writers um, and what's happening right now in our country is to support journalists until the NEA comes down. I'm very aware of that. And I've been writing different organizations that I either give money to or do volunteer work. I'm a big, I believe in volunteerism very strongly. Um, and so just reiterating that you're probably going to lose your budget, but if I can help in any way, you know, please call on me. They I don't saved know it how. last time. Hmm? They saved it yeah. last time. Yeah. Um, so we're going to take questions from the audience. There's a, a microphone right here, and just come on down and stand at the mic. We'd love to hear from you. Yes, anybody? Don't be shy. We need the first person to come on up. Yes, sir. I would like your views on Amazon, which, in my opinion, probably destroyed the bookstore but through its Kindle may well have induced more people to read. What are your views on that, if you have any? What do you all think about Amazon? <laughs> I'll bite. Um, so being a person who does not sell books, I don't make money from a direct sale of a book, I'm sort of neutral on how people access um, work. 
if you read a book and you purchase it on Amazon or at Barnes and Noble or your indie bookstore, or you've taken it from a library, I just want you to read a book, right? That's like my kind of general professional stance. Um, I do think that Amazon puts enormous pressure um, on the publishers and that in turn puts enormous pressure on the authors who are deriving their income from the sales of their books. And if they are not getting good deals, they are not making a living. And I think that when you look at, you know, over the past 50 years, what it looks like economically to be a writer, um, it's bleak, the number of people who are able to make their money just from doing the work that they do from their vocation. Um, and so for whatever role the economy of internet book buying um, plays in that, I think that, you know, it's a shame. It's a shame anything that makes it such that authors can't make a living, I think is really, really, really hard. Um, I don't know that the Kindle has changed the way that we read. I think there have been reports over the past couple of years that remind us that the paper book is alive and well, um, and that the bookstore is in fact not dead. Um, so more people are reading in paper um, than they are reading digitally. Bookstores for the second year in a row after a six year plummet um, have had increased returns. They are a $12 billion industry. Um, they rose 2.5% this past year. They rose the year before. More people are opening bookstores. Um, so I think, you know, Amazon is its own thing. And um, I don't hate Amazon. You know, and I, I don't hate their bookstore. I went to their bookstore and it was actually lovely. Um, but I believe in the indies and I believe in Barnes and Noble and I believe in um, people caring about paper. So I don't think it's as bleak and that's part of what I've spent a lot of time in the past year doing which is saying, okay, so bookstores aren't dead, books aren't dead, people are reading, we like paper, we have actual physical books in our libraries and our homes. Um, so I think that the narrative is like, we got so much bad news. And I think, you know, my dad used to say to me, like, well before, you know, Kindles were like a thing in everybody's home, he was like, you know there's going to be no such thing as a paper book anymore, right? And, because he's like a computer person, and he would say all the time, and I was like, no, they're never going away. They're never going to not have books. There's always going to be books. And I get really upset because I was like a kid. And I got the really delightful experience of showing my dad this article and going, nah, nana poo poo, you were so wrong. And um, I think it's, you know, I think we have to try and sing the praises of what's happening and pay attention. And I read this stuff in, like, Publishers Weekly and Publishers Lunch and all these, like, sort of trade publications that people don't generally see. But, you know, one of the things that I've tried to do is to take a lot of what I know and that you know and that you guys probably see all the time and to communicate if I'm talking to a reporter who's at the New York Times or, well, you do a great job, but, like, a lot of other... A lot of other publications do a really poor job of talking about books in an appropriate way. And so if I'm talking to one of those outlets, I try to make the case that it's like, well, no, well, let me send you several of these articles that I've been reading in the trades that are actually reporting what's happening in books. So, you know, I think Amazon presents a challenge for a lot of different types of businesses and a, different, a lot of different types of professionals. But I do think that, um, again, that idea of if we rise and if we sell more books and we cultivate a bigger, more diverse audience than I think that, and we think about you know, tax incentives in different cities and states for opening up a bookstore, um, bringing down taxes on books. Like we don't pay taxes on clothing underneath $100 in New York City. We don't pay taxes on clothing in New Jersey at all. And so what if we provide these kinds of economic incentives around books, right? Like does that change the way that we shop and does that change the plate of bookstores? Does that encourage somebody to open a bookstore in Queens or in you know, a remote area where they never would have thought because they've actually been given, just like we're encouraged to buy HUD homes for a dollar in areas where, you know, where there's abandoned houses or we're encouraged women or minorities to open businesses. Um, it might change the game. So I just think it's not the end of the story. I think Amazon's not the end of the story. I, I just want to say about your question, I don't know what the answer is, um, but I'm realizing part of... Uh, winning the National Book Award, what it taught me is I did go on tour everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it was an amazing experience to be on tour while the election was ramping up. And going to these places where I saw utter depression. 
economic depression. I mean, I talk about book desert. It's like everything desert. I mean, it was really, and that's why I kept saying yes when they would ask me to go to places I'd never been. Um, so that was really amazing. I learned about the publishing industry. I learned about all these people. I learned about the country. But now that um, my tour is slowing down and I'm thinking about my work, I realize it's not my job as a writer to think about Amazon or Kindle or not. It's not my job. I will do the worst writing ever if I think about the business of writing. My job right now is to try to forget that you exist, that I exist, that Amazon exists, that paper exists, that ink exists. My job is to forget the whole world right now. Otherwise, I will never find that place that I once lived in when I wrote my first book. I'll never, I'll never find it again. And it's been something I've been trying to figure out and talk to other writers about. It's like, how did you get back inside? You know? And so I just wanted to offer that um, because I think it's a conversation we need to have more about what writers actually do and need. Someone, I, I was at a reading last night actually, and uh, this guy came up to me afterwards. He was like, all the questions were political. I said, yeah, that's okay. And he goes, no, what about craft? And I was like, thank you. You know, yeah, I'm a big formalist, so that's wonderful. So I appreciate your question very much, but as a writer, I don't think it's my, I don't think it would be helpful to my doing work that you might want to read in the future if I thought about the answer too much. I also think, you know, with the Amazon conversation, like, let's not go down so easy. You know, I mean, it's like a little competition. I mean, capitalism aside. Um, you know, a little competition never hurt anybody, and I think that we, we can't just lay down, you know, any business or industry can't just lay down. Um, no, no, I didn't, I didn't mean that you were, but I mean, this is a conversation that gets had a lot, so I'm yeah. responding and reacting to, There's... yeah, I'm responding and reacting to much of the conversation that's happening, not even just the question. And, and I just want to say one more thing. I, um... Uh, I, I have a lot of former lives. One of them is I used to be a theologian of ancient languages, and, uh... So for me, history is much broader than a lot of people. And so when I think about these kinds of things, I tend to get very weird and freaky and go, oh, a thousand years from now, it won't matter. <laughs> I do. I'm serious. And it's not necessarily the healthiest way. I'm sure it's some kind of psychological defense so I don't have to feel the pain of my life. But, <laughs> but having said that, you know, the book has been around a long time. I mean, or let me put it this way, paper and ink have been around a long time. And I think what's true about human beings is for some reason we must create. We don't know why. They're still trying to figure out. Neurologists, neuroscientists, everybody's trying to figure out why human beings must create art. We don't know why yet. Do you know? And we've been doing it, what, the last time they clocked a painting 38,000 years in Indonesia? The, the earliest painting we can find, you know? So I'm kind of have, I'm, I'm a hippie, I kind of have faith that human beings will figure it out no matter what. So we have time for one more question. Do we have another question in the audience? Come on. Hi, thank you guys so much for um, talking today. Um, I had the privilege of hearing Lisa Lucas talk yesterday, so two times, yay. Um, but. It's been great to hear the rest of you guys talk. Um, and so as a very ambitious and naive 20-something year old um, who aspires to maybe one day sit in those seats, um, my question is, how can I get there? <laughs> <laughs> She's the well, most capable I cut, her, I cut her off, so I feel bad. So. In the last question. I was going to answer the easy question. <laughs> I, think she, I think she could answer the easy question. And then we'll figure out the second one. No, I was only going to share just... If you look over kind of the pattern of, um, you know, uh, spikes in modernization over the last, let's say, 150 years, like the thing that's changed life the most for people has been the advent of the washing machine because women used to spend on hour, on average, excuse me, six hours a day washing clothes for men and children. Um, and uh, that's, uh, so uh, people who theorize these things and even these, these kind of crackpot futurists 
don't they can they do acknowledge that the internet has not really changed uh, daily life all that much even though we kind of we live inside this narrative that everything is different now you know soon we're just going to be living online i mean it, it hasn't really objectively changed life all that much i don't know anything about the publishing industry or amazon or any of that kind of stuff but i do think that the washing machine changed lives significantly and i don't really even know what kindle is but Maybe it'll change someone's life somewhere, but I doubt it will be that kind of magnificent shift in terms of what people do with their time each day, um, their, their labor hours. So that's all I was going to say. And with those extra six hours you should to sit up on this stage someday, I would say just read and read and read and then write and write and write. I do have one quick Amazon thing, too. I don't even really know... <laughs> like anything about that thing but my publisher sent me there once and I felt like I was being renditioned to like a supermax prison like ADX Florence Colorado like they won't tell you where you're going they don't tell you who they are or what the purpose of the meeting is and I got into the elevator and they said I'm sorry this is awkward but can you turn around and they didn't even want me to see what floor we were getting off at inside the building and the building has no windows and people don't tell you their names and it was just a really strange experience but let's go to the question how do you get there you want to take this one? I was going to say something else but it's okay um, how do you get to be a writer? Oh, I know what I was going to say. The other thing about Amazon. Sorry, and then I'll go. No, 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 no. It's important. No, you should have. It's, great. It's, great. it's a great question. You should have always. Always ask these questions. Is You can't really make a living off of poetry. I should say that. And I love that about poetry. I love it. Because, and it's just going to, where's the person to ask a question? How do you get there? There you are. Um, I love that about poetry because... Uh, I, 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 I hope uh, that I'm never really thinking, well, this is going to sell, right? Because I'm not. <laughs> so it's a really interesting place to be. Um, how do you get there? I think the Cliff Note version is absolutely right. You write and write and write and write and write and write. And you read, more importantly, you read and read and read and read and read and read and read. And at some point, you'll start sending your work out. I mean, it's so easy to submit now to journals, this whole submissible thing, submittable thing you do online. Um, you get your rejections back faster, too. Um, one, one thing that I try to do and, and, and is I try to get as many rejections as possible, right? You gotta get used to the rejection thing. I have friends, I am a Cavi Canham fellow, I applied for four years until I got in. I have friends who applied once and didn't get in, they're like, I'll never apply again. It's like, well, you'll never get in again either, right? So uh, you gotta get used to rejection is I think my my best advice is just that it's just so it's like as normal as air you just get rejected you just get used to it but you know reading is the best 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 thing it really is you can read you can learn everything i think about writing if you read very carefully when i said i read tony morrison's novel tar baby when i was in high school the thing that um that shook me kind of in terms of being a writer and i knew i'd wanted to write all my life since i was your age your age um is when I read Tar Baby, I was paying attention to the language. I wasn't just paying attention to the story, which is profound, speaking about black middle class girls, and I felt so validated. But also, I was paying attention to how she was telling the story. So, you know, I tell my students all the time, we're just going to read the commas in the story. We're just going to read the commas, right? Or we're just going to revise the semicolons. Or we're just going to look at the line breaks in this poem, nothing else. Right? I mean, that kind of meticulous, meticulous attention when you're reading will teach you everything you need to know. And then you can start experimenting on your own. It's fun. It's a fun life. But I don't think uh, you should do it for money, even though for some people, it, it, there's good money in writing, you know? But for most of us, there isn't any money in writing. So you gotta figure out why you're doing it. I do it because I just love it, and it keeps me from, you know, striking a match and burning down a building. <laughs> Seriously. Um, so I'm not a writer, but I can talk about just sort of like listening to you guys and a lot of the writers that have been around in my own professional career. But I think one of the things is like you're talking about being a theologian and you're talking about prison abolition. And I think that, you know, living a full life is one of the best things that you can Absolutely. do to um, be good at anything that you do. Right. Like it's being a whole person, I think, makes you better at um, as any kind of creative or cultural life. 
And so I think that's one thing. I think also discipline. You know, I mean, it's like, I think people don't want to talk about it. And it's like not just sitting down and being able to write for three hours, but it's about being able to write the check or pay the bill on time or just show up at the place that you're supposed to be at at 2.15 p.m. It's about being able to be uncomfortable and about being able to do the things that you have to do over and over and over again. Um, and then I think also, you know, I suspect from, you know, the time that I've spent with both of you that you don't often do things that you don't think feel right. And I think that being guided by, you know, an instinctual sense of sort of what feels good for you and making those kinds of choices. I've turned down jobs and that like made every bit of sense on paper that everyone in my life pressured me to do and that I knew um, didn't make sense for me. And, and a series of making those choices based on what I instinctually felt was good for me and like good for my development and good for my happiness um, led me to only do things that I really cared about, which was the only way I could get myself to do something really well and to have that kind of discipline and to keep learning and living and having new experiences. And so whether you're a writer or you're a cook or you're um, an arts administrator, I think that a lot of those things are important, just sort of guiding ways to deal with your life, for me at least. Yeah, also my goal was never to be sitting in this chair. My goal was to write a good poem. You know, I bet your goal was to write a good novel in some way. Or yeah, about. sure. I mean, I, do, I knew I wanted to be a writer, but I actually didn't really imagine that I would be capable of writing a novel. That seemed like something that was on another side of a rubricon to me, um, even until very much later till after I'd gone to a writing program and then on occasion I would meet a writer who was like a published author and they just seemed like they existed in a different world for me so I I don't teach but when I do interact with students I always want to somehow communicate to them that I'm not on the other side of a rubricon like with some, in some special vitrine as like I'm a published author I'm not in any way superior because of that status. Some of it is luck or I don't know what it is, but I, I wish I would have had more confidence when I was younger to just do what I wanted to do and not think that the other people who were getting to do it were getting to do it um, by virtue of the fact that they were not me, if that makes sense. Um, so I, I eventually came upon a subject that I sort of saw um, uh, as something that would be worthy of a novel. And for various reasons, I was the person to write it. And so I just went ahead and got started. At that point, I had like a couple people encouraging me, which was helpful, but I didn't always think I'm gonna like go write big books. Um, but once I wrote the first one, I've only, well now I've written three. I only have two published, I just finished the next one. But once I'd written one novel, I actually did sort of feel like um, I know that this is something that I, can do because I won't quit. I never think, oh, the problem is the subject that I chose or the shape or structure of this book. No, the problem is me if I can't finish it. And so I will stay and change myself or find some way through the door to make the thing work. So I, I know I can finish a book now. Um, but so I guess that's my narrative about novels. But I just thought of like one thing, um, about being young and wanting to be a writer, and maybe I'm out of touch and it doesn't apply, but um, sometimes I worry about younger people um, thinking that having an opinion is an achievement. And like maybe, I'm not on social media, but I look at it once in a while and I know sort of what happens there. And I worry about people thinking that they can sort of define themselves, even if it's just a passing thing for a day by saying, oh, I'm the kind of person that hates this. Um, and I would just say, move toward what you love um, and try not to define yourself um, through that kind of negative affect of like things that you don't like. Um, because it's, it, it doesn't, it, it's not productive, I guess. Maybe that's really obvious, but. Uh, I think our time is up and I thank you so much for coming and please join me in thanking Robin, Rachel and Lisa. Three brilliant ladies, thank you.